and welcome to episode 155 of Real Life Ghost Stories. To kick things off this week, I need to thank our newest Patreon subscribers. I would like to thank Katrina Rutter, Danny D, Susie Frost, Joe Beckinsell, Curtis and Amanda, Rosaline Riley, Alison Barry, Jordan Lewis, Alyssa Lansdell, Jessica Cooper, Samuel Herman, Roland James and Pappenfuss Charlie. Thank you so much for subscribing to the Patreon. I love you and appreciate you every single day. And our film review this week. Our film review is Pin. Pin was released in 1988. It has 6.6 out of 10 on IMDb and 58% on Rotten Tomatoes. Isolated by his strange parents, Leon finds solace in an imaginary friend, which happens to be an anatomy doll from his father's doctor's office. Unfortunately, the doll begins to take over Leon's life and his sister's life as well. Um, that pause is not for dramatic effect. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put it that way. I'm gonna do likes and dislikes, but if you've seen this film before, you, you're gonna, you're gonna know why I'm shell shocked after watching it. I kind of thought that this film was gonna make me laugh a little bit. It was going to be a bit like twee and almost silly with lots of close-ups of the of the dummy and and shocking music um while those things did happen it was also incredibly traumatizing and i i still don't think i'm okay after it i've i've been i've been thinking about that film a lot and not for good reasons so let's go let's go for let's go for our likes it was far less silly and ridiculous than i thought it was going to be like i said i went into it thinking that it was going to be really silly. I came out of it shell-shocked. I came out of it hardly able to remember my own name because I was so traumatised by what I had seen. The anatomically correct dummy was genuinely freaky. It was really quite scary. And I always think about dolls in other horror films like Chucky, which end up being a bit satirical. So they sort of, they take on that silly vibe where they're violent but they don't really, they're not really menacing or threatening. Where is this thing? This thing was an anatomically correct doll with no skin. That was man-sized. It had a penis, as you find out very early on in the film. And it it's scary. Th- those dead eyes, those, those dead eyes would not be teaching me anything about anatomy. They'd be teaching me about the afterlife. That's what they'd be teaching me about. There is a moment very early on in the film where you find out that the doll does in fact have a penis and I was not prepared for it I was not prepared for it at all and I and I kind of feel like I understand why Leon is so traumatized why he is the way he is it really do you know what it felt like a commentary on mental illness and cyclical trauma and I don't know whether it was meant to be or whether that was just accidental but it really felt like a commentary on the fact that unaddressed and obvious issues with parents can have very significant effects on their children. And it kind of felt like an alternative version of Psycho, which doesn't give away what's going to happen in the film at all, don't worry. But that's the kind of vibe I was getting. And I really thought that the acting would be really hammy because it's kind of classed as a B-movie, but I, I don't feel like it should be. Like the acting was decent. It wasn't great by today's standards. But for the time, it really, really wasn't that bad. It was definitely watchable. At first, I was kind of enjoying it for like the cringe factor. That's what I thought was going to be the whole way through with some sort of ridiculous crescendo to finish out the film. And then it got really dark. Like it got really dark really quickly. Uh, I'm going to tell you now to look out for the bit in the film where Leon does his poetry reading and it, it I was sitting there with my mouth open. Like I felt uncomfortable and it was uncomfortable in a good way. Do you know what I mean? Like like I, I, you were really watching his decline and I felt that. And I have to say I loved the ending. I thought the ending was very clever. Simple but effective and I really enjoyed it. Okay, so my dislikes. The musical score was awful. It was not good. It was not good. And there were moments that were really dark and intense moments that probably would have benefited from having no music at all and just leaned into the awkwardness of the silence. Like, there were bits where the music completely detracted from the drama of what was happening. And I guess it's kind of 80s, like, it's not uncommon for films at the time, but I think if you were remaking it today, I would lean into the silence for real. Right, and my big problem with it is also 
based on the time that it was made. And it kind of casts these sweeping brush strokes over mental illness, particularly obsessive compulsive disorder and schizophrenia, which I'm sure a lot of people watching now won't appreciate. So at one point, uh, one of the, the protagonists says, my brother has paranoid schizophrenia and he'll never get better, which is not the lived experience for a lot of people who live pretty fulfilled lives with schizophrenia. So that's kind of, it's a bit jarring to watch in this day and age. But I kind of had to put that aside and appreciate it for the time that it was made in. And it is, like I said, kind of making a commentary on the fact that their parents had clearly significant mental health issues and those were passed down to the children because of the way the children were raised and a huge amount of major, big, waving, Les Mis style red flags were just ignored, as kind of often happens in families. But yeah, these these red flags were pretty red. I mean, they were practically on fire and everyone just ignored ignored those big old red flags. And I can tell you now, it doesn't end well for anybody. And the other thing is pretty subjective. And I think it's part of my like <laughs> my Catholic guilt from being raised an Irish Catholic. But uh, it's heavy on the sex and it's pretty heavy on incest. And I'll say it before and I'll say it again. Moral of the story is that you shouldn't have sex with your sister, okay? It's not a good idea. It's not going to end well for anybody. But in all seriousness, I would recommend doing a Does the Dog Die? Search for this film because there's bits of it that people might find triggering or traumatic. I just found all the sex bits uncomfortable, which was what they were meant to be for the film. And I was watching them kind of behind a pillow. Not because I was scared, but because I did not want to see it, okay? Did not want to see it. No way. This film was truly bizarre. But was it bad? I I don't think so. I really don't think so. I think it's a very disturbing film. I'd call it more of a like psychological horror or psychological thriller maybe rather than it being like a pure horror film. But it is genuinely disturbing for sure. And you will be glad to know that you can watch the film in its entirety on YouTube. I'm not entirely sure how the channel is allowed to do it. But it is a channel, a commentary channel. They put in their commentary at various points throughout the film. Their commentary is entertaining, genuinely. Uh, So if you want to watch it, the link will be in the description of this episode. I'm going to give this film four out of five, which is probably going to be controversial to some people. But you know what? I was gripped the whole way through. I was uncomfortable. I didn't know where it was going to go. I thought I knew where it was going to go. And then the ending was really good. So four out of five for me. Today's episode is brought to you by HelloFresh. One woman. (laughs) I mean, what could possibly go wrong? And her quest to find America's number one meal kit. You just don't get it, do you? With the cost of groceries going up and up, now is the perfect time to get started with HelloFresh. HelloFresh is cheaper than grocery shopping. And it's 25% less expensive than takeout. And defeating an enemy that makes her face who she really is. We're not so different, you and I. And you just need to embrace it. HelloFresh knows you're busy. That's why they take care of the meal planning and the prepping. Freeing up extra time in your schedule. With pre-proportioned ingredients, foolproof recipes, and convenient doorstep delivery, HelloFresh makes it easy to get dinner on the table. <laughs> okay, I know, I know this is a movie trailer, but like, why, why would that be a part of your evil monologue? It doesn't just doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Hi, that's me. I bet you're wondering how I got here. Well, here's the thing: I've been using HelloFresh for ages and wanted to make the ads worthwhile. You know. But yeah, this is my personal endorsement. It's pretty good. I've been using it for 89 boxes. That's a pretty long time. So, uh, yep. Coming soon to a doorstep near you. Uh, guys, I think you need to come and look at this. It says, go to HelloFresh.com slash Real Life Ghost Stories 60 and use code Real Life Ghost Stories 60 for 60% off plus free shipping. What was that? HelloFresh.com forward slash Real Life Ghost Story 60 and use code Real Life Ghost Story 60 for 60% off plus free shipping. 
Progressive presents Adjusting to the Suburbs. You just bought a home in the suburbs, but no one told you about all the birds, specifically this one, who seems to be calling out Roy. Roy. But who exactly is Roy? And why doesn't he ever respond? Maybe Roy is just bird speak for save with Progressive by bundling your home and auto. I guess until Roy answers, we'll never know. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company coverage provided in service by affiliates and third-party insurers. Which brings us to our story this week. And as you've just heard, the film review this week was, it was bizarre. And so is the story that I'm about to tell you. When I went into this, I did not think that it was going to be as strange as it is. And I did not think it was going to have as many twists and turns as it does. So I just want to do a massive shout out to Paul Screeton. Paul Screeton is an author and he wrote a book called The Quest for the Hexam Heads, which is where literally all of my information for this story comes from and you'll see why I used this book at the end I'll explain why but just if you're looking for more information you could not get more information about this story than from this book so let's get into it. Reed Avenue was a pretty nondescript street in a nondescript village in the northeast of England and number three was a pretty nondescript house that was home to a very average family. It was 1972, and the Robsons had moved onto the street two weeks earlier, and after the general hustle and bustle of moving, everything had calmed down somewhat, enough for the family to focus their energy on the garden, which was overgrown and in desperate need of weeding. Unfortunately for 11-year-old Colin, he was deemed to be the perfect age to begin his first foray into the world of manual labour, As he swiped and pulled up the stubborn weeds, he muttered every curse word he knew under his breath and periodically scowled at his brother Leslie, who was watching him and waving through the upstairs window. Leslie was nine and therefore seemed to get away with never having to do anything. His waving was definitely antagonistic too. He was waving smugly. How is that even possible? Colin bent back down to the soil to move a stone that was now semi-buried on the surface. He knew as soon as he picked it up that something was different. The stone felt different in his hand. It was the perfect weight and the perfect size and it felt smooth and purposeful. He stopped what he was doing and straightened up with the rock in his hand. He turned it over, rubbing the soil from its surface and he began to feel strange. There was some sense of anticipation that he didn't quite understand. Leslie, he shouted excitedly, Leslie, come see what I found. Leslie was determined not to be left out and was by Colin's side, gazing at the rock as quick as a flash. They both stood in silence and looked at the stone. Maybe there are more, Leslie tentatively suggested. In actuality, he was feeling very left out that Colin had found something cool and he hadn't. So he dropped to the ground and with some careless digging and a lot of soil being flung, he found another one. What the boys didn't know was that these two stones heralded a strange adventure. I suppose now is the time to tell you what they actually found before continuing with this bizarre little tale. The two boys had found two stone heads. They fit in the palm of your hand and were about the size of a small tangerine. They were both dense and heavy and definitely not hollow. The really striking thing about the heads was their faces, if you could call them that. They are, if nothing else, disturbing. The first head had a skull-like appearance, with lines and features that were only barely visible, but it was also somehow clearly, definitely male, and bore the distinctive hairstyle that is seen in Celtic carvings. The stone was greenish-grey and glistened with quartz crystals. The second head was much more sinister, It seemed to depict a woman, or rather more accurately some sort of hag, with defined hollow features, gaping eyes and a hooked nose. Her hair was scraped back into a bun and there seemed to be the remnants of a coloured pigment in her hair. The boys were fascinated by them and thought they were a cool little find. But what they found even more interesting was the resemblance to something that Colin had recently made in school. Colin had made a head out of clay 
which his teacher had told him was grotesque. The truth was that Colin hadn't really known why he had made it. The idea of it had popped into his head, but he knew nothing about Celtic sculpture and imagery. The boys eventually brought the heads inside and put them on the mantelpiece. The change in the household was almost immediate. There were seven people in the family and they all reported witnessing the strange phenomena that happened next. It started with the heads being turned the wrong way around in the mornings when the family would awake. But obviously, being a big household, everyone assumed that someone else was responsible. They had all thought the heads were creepy, albeit amusing. So when someone would awake to find the heads facing the direction of the spot they were discovered, they would tut and assume that another family member was trying to wind them up. One evening, as the family were watching television, they heard the unmistakable sound of a whip cracking behind their television set. Their father, Albert, jumped from his seat, thinking that there had been a wiring fault or an electrical issue that had caused the huge crack. He unplugged the TV in a panic and searched everywhere he could think of to find the source of the noise. But nothing. There was no conceivable explanation as to where the noise had come from or what had caused it. Albert couldn't understand it. He had never heard a sound like it, and it seemed to have materialised in thin air behind the TV. But as is often the case in busy households, everyone quickly forgot about it and moved on. At 2.30am, the Robson house was quiet, and everyone was sleeping. A loud smash awoke everyone and sent the house into a frenzy. Jenny presumed that one of the children was up and doing something they shouldn't be, and she groaned and clambered out of bed, wrapping her dressing gown around her. She stumbled out into the hallway as the blinking eyes of their children appeared at the bedroom door. I swear you children will be the death of me. But none of their confused, bleary-eyed faces betrayed any guilt. She went downstairs expecting to see a broken glass in the kitchen, but there was nothing. No glass and no sign that anything had been disturbed. If it hadn't been for the fact that the whole family had been disturbed by the crash, she would have thought it was a particularly vivid dream. She frowned as she made her way back to bed, and really she was too tired to even consider it right now. The next morning Albert went downstairs to have his breakfast, and found Jenny staring at the hob looking utterly confused. Her brow was furrowed, and she stared at the frying pan that sat on one of the unlit rings. Have you forgotten how to make breakfast? Albert joked. She didn't answer immediately, but continued to stare at the frying pan. The mirror in the hallway, she said. It's gone. Albert looked at her and out at the empty space on the wall in the hallway. That was the crash we heard last night, she continued. I must not have noticed it was gone last night when I came downstairs. She knew that when she had come down there was no remnants of the mirror on the floor anyway. She had padded around in her slippers and there was nothing out of place. God, I must have put it up badly, said Albert, shaking his head. Sorry, love, I'll get another one as soon as I can. Jenny looked up at him for the first time and in almost a whisper she said, Albert, listen to me. The mirror broke last night and woke us up. I came downstairs and there was nothing. It wasn't the kids, I could tell by their faces. This morning when I got up, the mirror was here. In the frying pan. At least the pieces of it were. Every single little piece was in the frying pan. They agreed not to tell the children, but the children would soon bear the brunt of it. That night, after a relatively normal day, the boys woke up at 2.30am, with their beds full of shards of glass. But their experience would pale in comparison to the experience of Mrs. Dodd. Mrs. Dodd lived next door to the Robsons and was vaguely aware of the discovery in the garden, but was unfazed by it and also didn't know about the poltergeist activity that was happening next door. One night, the Robson household was awoken not by the activity in their own house, but by a frantic scream from next door followed by the sound of running feet and panicked voices. Mrs. Dodd had crawled into bed beside one of her children, who was plagued with a toothache. 
She lay in bed hoping to soothe them into some semblance of sleep when she felt a cold chill in the air. She shivered and wrapped the duvet around her and her little one a bit more tightly. She became aware of a shadow in the doorway and assumed it was her husband coming to check on her and the little one. She looked up and froze. Standing in the doorway breathing heavily was what looked like a man at first glance. A man on all fours. But something was terribly wrong. It seemed to be some sort of half man, half animal, like a man with the head of a sheep or a goat. She screamed, petrified, and at the sound of her scream, the creature rose up onto its hind legs, lumbered down the stairs and out the door. She heard each step as it made its way down the stairs. The creature was gone by the time her husband burst into the room to see what had happened. Mrs. Dodd had never seen a ghost, and really didn't believe in one. But since next door had found those heads, her children had reported hearing the pitter-patter of feet running around their bedroom at night time, something that was on all fours. And now this creature had somehow made its way into her house. It was at this point that the heads found their way into the hands of some experts, including Dr. Anne Ross. The heads had found their way into Anne's possession after she had been handed pictures of them by a colleague and asked to have a look at them. She did consultancy work for a number of museums due to her expertise in pagan Celtic artefacts. When Dr. Ross came face to face with the heads, she was immediately repulsed. They were no more detailed or ugly than any other Celtic heads that she had seen, but these gave her an immediate unsettled feeling. She put them hastily back in their box and closed it, hoping to get them geologically analysed as soon as possible, so she could make her decision and get them sent back to the north quickly. She didn't want to keep them around for longer than was necessary, but it was already too late. What happened next is taken directly from Dr. Ross's testimony, as was written in Paul Screeton's book, The Quest for the Hexham Heads. A night or two after they arrived, I I didn't connect this experience with the heads until later. I woke up suddenly at around 2am, deeply frightened and very cold. I looked towards the door, and by the corridor light glimpsed a tall figure slipping out of the room. My impression was that the figure was dark, like a shadow, and that it was part animal and part man. I felt compelled to follow it, as if by some irresistible force. I heard it, whatever it was going downstairs and then I saw it again moving along the corridor that leads to the kitchen but now I was too terrified to go on I thought I must have had a nightmare though I could hardly believe that a nightmare could be so real and I decided to say nothing about it a few days later when the house was empty my teenage daughter Bernice came home from school at about 4 p.m two hours before my husband and I returned from London when we arrived home she was deathly pale and clearly in a state of shock. She said that something horrible had happened, but at first would not tell us. But the story came out. When she had come home from school, the first thing she had seen was something huge, dark and inhuman on the stairs. It had rushed down the stairs towards her, vaulted over the banisters, and landed in the corridor with a soft thud that made her think its feet were padded, like those of an animal. It had run towards her room, and though terrified, she had felt that she had to follow it. At the door, it had vanished, leaving her in the state in which we had found her. We calmed her down as best we could, and feeling puzzled and disturbed ourselves, we searched the house. Again, there was no sign of any intruder, nor, in fact, did we expect to find any. Since then, I have often felt a cold presence in the house, and more than once have heard the same soft thud of an animal's pads on the staircase. Several times my study door has burst open and there had been no one there and no wind to account for it. And on one occasion, when Bernice and I were coming downstairs together, we both thought we saw a dark figure ahead of us and heard it land in the corridor after vaulting over the banisters. It is important to note here that Dr. Ross had not been aware of what had happened in the house next door to where the heads were found until after these events. Dr. Ross quickly set about publishing an article about the heads, in which she was reticent to pinpoint a particular date or time period in which the heads originated, 
but maintained that they were found in an area that was of ancient significance. Dr. Ross sent the heads to Professor Hodson, a geologist at Southampton University, who concluded that both heads were made of the same material, a very coarse sandstone with rounded quartz grains, which had been made locally in the northeast of England. It was all very compelling. But our story now becomes even more twisty and turny. The heads were sent to a Dr. Douglas Robson of Newcastle University, who concluded that the heads were actually made from artificial cement. Two literal experts in their field gave startlingly different results, and no one seemed any closer to establishing where exactly these two heads had come from. The heads fell into the hands of Don Robbins, a chemist who believed that the heads were representative of the existence of the stone tape theory. Stone tape theory is the idea that ghosts and hauntings are essentially tape recordings of energy that are recorded, as it were, onto rocks and other items and can be released and replayed under the right conditions. So was it possible that these rocks, these gruesome little heads, contained the energy of something dark, something primal? Or was it possible that these heads were the result of an accidental hoax? Des Craigie had lived in number three previously and was shocked when the two little heads that he had carved for his daughter were suddenly making waves in the local newspapers and TV shows. Des went to the local newspaper and agreed to give an exclusive interview. He claimed that ten years previously he had made the stone heads for his daughter. There had been three of them and she played with them all the time until eventually they were buried in the garden and forgotten about. One of the heads went missing and was never found, but the other two were unearthed by the Robson boys and were apparently the root cause of their paranormal problems and the arrival of this mysterious were-sheep that was appearing in people's bedrooms. It was widely accepted that Des Craigie's series of events were the real events. However, it was later established that Des Craigie was, by his very nature, a bit of a prankster and would allegedly regularly perform both simple and elaborate pranks in order to wind up the people in his life. He was also unable to recreate the heads. He had made three more in order to prove that he had made them in the first place, but was unable to replicate them, and was also seemingly unable to explain how he had made the heads in the first place. So, there are numerous twists and turns in this strange little tale, Either they are genuinely cursed ancient Celtic heads that carry some sort of evil entity inside them, or they are two concrete heads made as a children's toy and mistaken for something more mysterious. Although why anyone would give children a toy that looked like these heads is beyond me. The heads were sent to museums, to geologists, to archaeologists, to chemists, to historians and to psychics, and all sorts of experiments were conducted on them. Some claimed that the heads were real ancient artefacts and others claimed that they were modern made. Some claimed to have never heard or felt anything as a result of the heads, whereas some claimed that the heads brought poltergeist activity with them wherever they went. But there is something that is almost seductive about this story, and I think it's because of its ambiguity. In their blog, the urban historian writes, They are many things, and perhaps none of them. They are totemic. They are toys or gifts. They are possessed with an evil power to attract supernatural events. They are stone. They are cement. They are ancient. They are from the 1960s. They are evil. They are mundane. They are lost. They are hidden. They are destroyed. They are curated. The list goes on. Because like so many things that we interact with, they are entangled with us and our stories and motivations and beliefs and hopes and fears. They haunt us because of this slipperiness this quality of shape-shifting, and yet this is a quality that most material culture possesses, because we ensure these do not remain inanimate objects through our interactions with them. And while this particular story took me on a weird and wonderful journey that got more and more bizarre as more and more people became involved, what I was struck by and left with was an interview with Colin Robson when he was an adult in his 50s. He recalled finding the heads, and the incidents that occurred afterwards. He confirmed the horrible, terrified screams of Mrs. Dodd next door, and her confirmation that some half-beast, half-human creature had been in her bedroom. 
He remembered that when he found the heads, the first place he took them was to Mrs. Dodd, because he wanted to show her what he had found, so they ended up in her house first. He remembers getting up to the mirror in the frying pan and the glass in the bed. He remembers pictures being removed from the wall somehow and thrown across rooms. He remembers physically seeing his mother's ornaments jumping from the walls one by one while the family watched in horror as they crashed against the wall opposite. That one, in particular, affected him for the rest of his life. He remembers his mother becoming upset at the heads moving in the night. He also remembers that nothing strange happened until they brought the heads into the house. You'll be glad to know that the heads are missing, and have been for a number of years. No one knows where they are, so they could be waiting to be unearthed and reintroduced to the modern world. When Colin Robson was concluding the interview... He speculated about the whereabouts of the heads and was desperate to know a definitive answer. He said, All you can do is ask. And there's never any answers, is there? Before we get into any of the nitty gritty, I need to say that, as I said in the beginning, all of my information came from the book called Quest for the Hexham Heads by Paul Screeton. And this man unearthed. (gasps) Sorry to interrupt myself but there's a new cat outside that's very exciting it's a very nice cat anyway this man Paul Screeton unearthed every single bit of information about the Hexham heads that he could find so he found all the newspaper reports because there were loads he found all of the old archived television interviews that still existed he interviewed pretty much everybody from the case that he could get his hands on neighbours siblings, children, people in the local area. He interviewed friends of Des Craigie, for example, to find out what kind of character he was. There was no stone left unturned in this, in his research. I have literally never come across a paranormal story that has more information about it, genuinely. It was virtually impossible to get through, but also incredibly detailed and thorough. So let's get into my thoughts on this story. Firstly, that little art clay head that Colin did when he was in school is genuinely really creepy. And it is genuinely incredibly similar to the heads. It is scary. It is not something that I would be happy if my child brought home from school. If my kid brought that home from school, I'd be like, does my child need therapy? Like, are they okay? What's going on here? Because it is a creepy little head. And it's, it's very similar to the heads that they then found. And I think it's really important to point out, which Paul Screeton points out the entire way through his book, is that the discrepancies in the narratives are really significant. So ages are different in everybody's different narratives, dates where they found the heads. So some places say they found the heads in the garden. Other places say they found the heads out and about near Hadrian's Wall. The size of the heads is disputed, like who has them, whoever had them. Who lost them? And what's interesting is numerous people gave numerous interviews for different publications about this particular story. And even their stories changed every time. So there isn't really a reliable narrator in this story based on the fact that there are so many inconsistencies in different people's stories. So I just want to put that out there. It was really hard to find a thread. So for example, the story about the were sheep coming to visit the woman next door was misprinted in the newspapers so that it ended up being accredited to two completely different women. And um, Paul Screeton went and found the children of the woman next door who confirmed the story. And they said that they remembered it happening. They remembered hearing something running around the bedroom on all fours. They remembered their mother screaming like the child who was in the bed sick remembered being wrapped up in the duvet and remembered feeling like there was something in the room, like a man slash animal, something that was really dangerous was in the room with them. And he said that he still remembers the fear to this day. And he remembered his mother screaming and the sound of this big creature running down the stairs, which I thought was wild that he had tracked down those people. And they still, to this day, were like, no, that that really did happen. Really interestingly, too, he tracked down Des Craigie's son, who believed that he had a rightful claim to the heads. So he was like, whoever has them, they actually belong to me because my dad said that he made them. 
and he went and spoke to like Des Craigie's friends who all said oh he was a bit of a prankster like we don't actually believe that he did this and then obviously speaking to Colin no no these heads were not made by that man so listen I'm just going by all of the different stuff that I read so if you're listening to this I'm not casting aspersions on anybody's character just trying to unpick a very complex story you know Dr. Anne Ross is also a really interesting character. So she's vague at best. Like she really hurriedly published this article about the stones, about the heads with absolutely no scientific data to back her up. So immediately she was putting the heckles up on the other scientific people in the community because they were saying, hang on, you've no data here. You're just talking about vague timelines and feelings like that doesn't count in scientific journals which is very true and her stories changed a lot and I guess it's important to note with her as well is that she was really into mystical bits so she very publicly spoke about the fact that uh, a number of the artifacts that she had worked with over the years she believed were cursed or haunted there also seems to have been some evidence that she was kind of a big fan of Alistair Crowley and she was very reluctant it would seem by these narratives to ever admit that she might be wrong when Des Craigie came out and said, oh, I actually made these stones, she doubled down. She completely doubled down and was like, that's absolutely impossible. When it actually wasn't impossible because she didn't know where the stones had come from or what they were made of or what time period they came from. So it wasn't impossible. So she's a really interesting character. And then there's the part of me that thinks, well, maybe. Maybe it, maybe there is something to this story. So in terms of importance for the Celtic people, these hexam heads are very similar to other carved heads of the time period. So the carved heads of the time period apparently generally had this very distinctive neck on the heads, which these heads seem to have. And these little stone heads have been found all over Northern Europe. They are everywhere. People have found them in all sorts of places, but generally close to water or a spring or a well. So it is believed that these people thought the head was where your soul was. So the head was obviously the most important part of the body and the head then became really important in ritual. So these little stone heads represented a lot of their spiritual beliefs. They would have used these little stone heads for rituals and also for worship and in a more kind of gory way when these people went into battle they would wear the heads of their enemies as trophies afterwards so the head was really important to them and I that probably sounds really simplistic but they definitely had some sort of spiritual significance and for a very long period of time like we refer to them as like Celtic heads but they don't really so historians don't really seem to be able to accurately decide where these heads belong when they're found like what time period because they didn't change for a really long period of time and they kind of closely resemble what we know to be Celtic art so that's just that's just my vague googlings so I could be completely wrong about that but they were significant and they were important that's the main thing that we need to take away from it is it possible that they unlocked some sort of were sheep I keep calling it were sheep because I don't know what else to call it I don't know Is it possible that it contains some sort of poltergeist activity? I don't know. Like, it doesn't sound like they brought the heads in and they were all freaked out by them. It sounds like the kids brought the heads in and everyone went, oh, those are weird looking. But gas, like that you found them in the garden, that's cool. Like, it doesn't sound like they had any prior knowledge that they might be in any way of spiritual significance. So it's interesting that this mad story grew up around these two heads where suddenly you've got this family who's under attack from poltergeists and the woman next door is seeing a wear sheep and then this person comes along and takes them away to study them and nobody can really ascertain as to where they came from or what time period it is but some people say modern some people say ancient but you know one of the experts says that she experienced horrible things in her house after bringing them home others didn't I don't know do let me know what you think I'd be interested to hear your thoughts Thank you so much for listening to this particularly rambly episode of Real Life Ghost Stories. If you would like to find out more about Real Life Ghost Stories that is less rambly, then you can go on to reallifeghoststoriespodcast.com. 
If you'd like to sign up to Patreon, you can do so on patreon.com forward slash real life ghost stories, where for $5 a month or $2 a month, you get access to lots of extra content and also all of the normal content ad free. And on that note, I shall see you next time.